Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Dolfini, Landlord Coach. It is good to see you, and uh, I know many of you are used to seeing me on the Landlord Coach Daily Is Show, and this is not that. <laughs> so if you're if you're joining me, thinking that this is the Landlord Coach Daily Is Show, um, that's to come up. We're going to be coming up on that here in just a few minutes. Uh, well, probably about an hour, hour and a half or so. So this is going to be a little bit more free form. This is uh, I've got a couple of different topics to talk about today. So. Um, if you are watching this live, I'm going to go ahead and leave the chat box open so if you can ask specific questions, whether you're watching this on the Landlord Coach Facebook page or you may be watching it on the Landlord Coach channel on YouTube. And that's the uh, that's currently where we're broadcasting it to. So uh, growing both audiences, it's been really fun doing this and I've been really enjoying it. So I'm going to do this. Uh, I'll do this once in a while. I don't really know how often I'll do these live, these just specific live events. But uh, anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, cover a couple things. But today we're going to be talking about a couple different things, <clears throat> some stuff in the news, some stuff it, uh, that that's just different things and, uh, that I've been asked, getting questions asked about that be, it would take too long to explain on the Landlord Coach Daily Show. Uh, for those of you who are, uh, who do watch that show, generally it's uh, daily-ish. Right, I just don't feel like doing it every single day, but it is a it's a daily ish show. But it's a, that's not what this is right now. Um, but the, one of the questions that I get quite often is, "Hey, coach, I'm not really interested in managing properties for myself. Like, I just don't have the bandwidth. I don't really have the interest. I don't have the skill set. And quite frankly, some of you have recognized and you've been listening. I'm very proud of my listeners that this is a people business. There is no getting around that." And if you're just not into people and you just don't have that in your in your sphere to, to listen again uh, you know, or deal with people, then good for you. Good for you for recognizing that up front. And you're just like, well, I really just want to turn this over to a property manager and let them, uh, let them handle it. So the question I'm going to be going over today is there are five key operational things that a property manager must do in order to be effective. Now, I am also a property manager, so there's other things that that go into this that I have a little bit different perspective because I'm I'm both a an investor and a property manager. So I see it on both ends. So I think I have a unique perspective to be able to to uh, answer this. And and I know that there's probably going to be same some people that are going to say, well, that's not the only five. All right, whatever. I'm not going to sit here and debate. But I but these are five critical operational things that I think every every business um, every every person that needs to focus on if you're a property manager. So we'll cover that here in a little bit. Um, also, some other things we're going to talk about today is um, there's a a um, a, uh, an, a what am I trying to say here? An article by Mindy Jensen or on Mindy Jensen was posted today by Yahoo Finance. If you know Mindy Jensen or if you've heard her name, she is of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, and I uh, I just thought it was a really good article because there was a lot of stuff that she said in there that was just 100% spot on, and uh, really appreciate. I know everybody appreciates what Bigger Pockets does and what they put out there the information they put out there is is always solid and her her advice I thought was really good so I want to cover a couple things there and then there was a, a another article that was put out a couple days ago um, by CNBC for the National Football League um, uh, relating to this running back LaShawn McCoy who is getting into real estate investing and uh, is taking advantage of opportunity zones and I uh, I really thought that it was it was a really it was a really cool thing that that he's doing, and we'll be talking about that here a little bit today. So first and foremost, let's get it to the 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 nuts and bolts of what I was talking about earlier on was the five key operational things a property manager must do. They just simply must do to be effective. So being a property manager can be tough, and it's one of those things that if you it, especially if you don't have the proper infrastructure or process. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a couple of guys who are looking to get into the property management business that have messaged me. And uh, even though I'm, you know, my moniker is the landlord coach, you know, the irony is I don't want people to be landlords. I want people to be business owners. I want people to be investors. And the more, uh, the more focused you can be on that goal, that's going to keep you out of the operations. And it's, and ideally it's going to give you, it's going to make you, it's going to force you to get people that are going to 
check, uh, cover your blind spots or just things that you just you can't be great at everything no matter how good you are you can't be great at everything and I'm good at a lot of different stuff but I'm horrible at a lot of other things probably a lot more other things than I'm good at so I'm great at a couple things I'm good at a lot of things but I'm terrible at most things so when I come to that realization that there's just certain things that I shouldn't be doing shouldn't be spending my time on they, these are some of the things that I had to recognize okay well what does a property manager need to do and what are some of the things that I need to step out of and turn these over to other people that are just way better at it you know like my the, the person who handles the resident resources stuff who handles all the, the the collections and the and the outreach she's fantastic at her job the leasing person that we have she is fantastic at her job and, you know my maintenance guy you know he's a maintenance supervisor he is fantastic at his job and I need to give those people the tools and get out of their way and support them when they need support and that's probably the best thing that I can do as their boss, as their as the property manager, is make sure that they all have the proper tools, right? Um, my accounting person, she's fantastic at her job. I need to make sure that it, she's got the right tools for her toolbox. I don't want to set her up to fail and say, hey, here's an Excel spreadsheet. Go ahead and keep all the books on my Excel spreadsheet, right? That's terrible. That's not giving her the, the proper tools. That's not giving her the proper support. So these are the sorts of things that I'm talking about. So. In terms of the five key operational things a property manager must do to be effective. So first and foremost, first and foremost, I don't care if nothing else gets handled, this has to get handled before anything else pretty much has to get handled, right? And that's number one is to preserve property. If you're not focusing on making sure that the property preservation piece is done and done adequately, you're failing your people. Now, there's there's a lot that goes into this property preservation piece and and I recognize too that this is also where a lot of property managers are set up to fail. So in the early days when I was doing property management, I had just got my license and I was growing like, I mean, I was probably getting 20, 30 calls a month for people to take on properties that, that they couldn't sell or whatever else it was and uh, maybe people that were buying properties and I was busier than a, I mean, than a one-armed paper hanger. It was absolutely crazy. And the property preservation piece was so incredibly important even back then, even when people didn't have money. But that was one of the things that helped pull me out of my financial distress that I was in back in 2010, 2011, right? So preserving the property was one of the things that was really important to the people that were coming to me because these were homes that they lived in at one point in time. So let's keep in mind in terms of how this was all going down. It's you know 2010, 2011, 2012. Properties were really still not selling great. They were selling better than they were back in 08 and 09, but they still weren't selling great. And a lot of times people didn't have enough equity in the property, even if they did want to sell. So you know if they if they wanted you know they might have needed two hundred twenty five thousand uh, dollars to to pay off their mortgage, but the property might have only sold for two hundred and twenty. Or maybe it would sell right at 225, but with closing costs and everything they would pay to the realtors, you know, they'd have to come to the table with a check for 20 grand. That wasn't going to work for them. You know, everybody was just 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 at that point getting back to work and everything else. So of course, at that point in time, I was the bridge to get them to the other side to where they could get either the equity paid down on their mortgage, or they would have appreciation of the property so they could get out of it and sell it. So that preservation piece of the property was incredibly important to them even though if they didn't necessarily realize it and that was my job as the property manager to, to let them know hey I, if I'm gonna build this bridge from now until the end of the end of the piece right like I needed to understand you know what was it they were trying to accomplish I needed to ask them that up front what is it you're trying to accomplish well look we're trying to sell this property we just we can't right now okay did definitely put up a few red flags for me later on I didn't know to think of that early on but it put up some red flags for me because I'm thinking okay how how well are these people going to be able to pay me for when things need to get done on the property that became a whole other issue but preservation of the property is really really important and what does that mean it means everything that in terms of maintenance upkeep repair all the things that you would naturally think of terms of property preservation and maintaining the value of the property and not letting it deteriorate. Most times when people are trying to buy properties, what are they looking for? They're looking for distressed properties, right? They're looking for distressed properties that people can't keep up. And generally, if you're looking at a distressed property, you're looking at a distressed owner who is willing to sell. Well, in these particular cases, they couldn't sell. They couldn't sell it for less 
than what they owed on it unless they went into a short sale situation and they didn't want to potentially ruin their credit. So that's why this property preservation piece was so big. But first and foremost, the the you know the property manager has to have a function that that manages the maintenance or preservation, property preservation. So that's the first thing that that they that they do and they take care of. So again, we're talking about five key operational things that a property manager must do to be effective. So uh, if you've got questions or comments, you can go ahead and plug them in to the comment section. I'll certainly uh, um, answer those along the way. So the second thing they do is manage vacancy. Now, this there's a couple of different things. Now, this might seem a little bit basic, like, well, how are you talking about managing vacancy? Well, there's obviously there's there's actual vacancy, there's whether you have an empty property and you have economic vacancy where you have someone in a property and they're not paying. So we're going to talk about the actual of management of a vacant property for right now. So the management of vacancy piece, that's a really critical piece to managing the property because if you've got a va if you've got an empty property, an empty property is not serving anybody well. Right. I mean, the, who vacant properties don't. They, I mean, they attract, um, you know, people who want to live in them. They want to squat in the properties. That's not good for anybody. There's a situation where people are, um, you know, uh, where they're taking really long times to get the properties rented, and you know, they might be showing. You know, if they're trying to self-manage it, they're only managing the properties. Uh, to do the showings on Saturdays or Sundays or maybe one day during the week. That's just not enough. You've got to recognize something. And whether you're a property manager or you're a self-manager, you have to recognize that you don't rent properties as much as you sell time. And when you get that in your mind and you that, that whole concept of selling time, and I got this, this concept from the hospitality industry. I worked for the Marriott for a few years. I worked for a, a small regional um uh, limited service hotel when I was working working my way through Purdue and uh, you know, so I, I was in the hospitality industry and one of the things that they really talked about a lot was unsold inventory and that unsold inventory meant room nights if you didn't sell a room night one night that room night was gone forever that inventory spoils so that concept of selling time you know, it's kind of like the same thing with the airlines. They want butts and seats. And if they don't get the butts and seats, that airline seat is forever lost because you're selling that moment with their butt in that seat for that period of time. And if they don't get that back, if they don't sell it, they're never getting that back. They're that spoiled inventory. So, so it's the same type of thing here. And they have to manage vacancy. And they have to manage vacancy well. If they're not managing their vacancy well, you know, there that that sold that lo that time is lost forever. So they have to be managing vacancy, and they have to be really intentional about how they do that. So right now, I'm just talking about actual vacancy. I'm going to talk about economic vacancy here in a minute. But the actual vacancy, how long does it take to go from? If you've been following me at all on the on the vacancy checklist, how long does it take them to go from day zero to day one? So to go from day zero to day one. How long is that in days? I mean, how many days of lost inventory are there? And sometimes some turns are really long because there's a lot of things that need to be done. And sometimes the turns can be as short as a day because the residents haven't really been that hard on it or, you know, the, the property is pretty well maintained to begin with. And it might just be going in and wiping a few things down and maybe touching up the paint, if that. So the shorter you can make that window, the shorter you can get that property back online is the is the best thing that they can do. Now, that again, this is we're talking in case you're joining us, we're talking about five operational things a property manager must do to be effective. Um, so um, first, we were talking about preservation of property, and secondly, we're talking about managing vacancy. So getting those properties back online and back on the market as quickly as possible, and then and then having the stream of people that is going to come in and 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 rent that property as quickly as possible. And ideally, you're going to have three, four, five people stacked up to watch to, to get into that property. Now, right now, properties are renting pretty easily not only because it's springtime and people generally like to move in the springtime, but also because there's a shortage of available housing on the market. So the, you know, whether you're buying, selling or renting right now, it's, you know, real estate is hot for that reason because people are trying to get into properties and, uh, and manage and, you know, 
and so managing vacancy should not be a problem. However, I do see some property managers somehow still struggle with this, and I don't, I don't get that. I don't understand why that is. You know, if uh, I mean, really, this is not a complex issue. It's just making sure that you have the right, um, you know, the, the getting getting the properties turned quickly and getting the properties listed on the market as quick as you possibly can. Um, you know, wh however you're doing that. Now, every market's a little bit different in terms of what's the best way to list it. I get that. I get that question a lot. Like, what's the best way to list my properties? You know, for some people, it's Facebook. For some people, it's Craigslist. For some people, you know, they list them on the MLS or their, you know, multiple listing service. And uh, I don't know. I don't know what to tell it is what's right for you. Some people, if you have a highly visible property, it's sticking a sign in the yard. And that's all it takes. And quite frankly, there's, there's people that, <laughs> I mean, there's times we can't even get a sign in the yard because our leasing agent, like I said, our leasing agent is so good. She's very responsive to getting people uh, or getting interest generated for the um, for the open unit. And a lot of times, you know, there's three and four people stacked up. I mean, it's not it's almost pointless to put a sign in the yard. So that's that's the that's a really cool thing. But you know, she's doing a lot of that through Facebook. But again, your market might be a little bit different. Your market might respond better to Craigslist or even even you know ads on uh, in the classifieds whatever but but you've got to be making sure that you're directing it to your ideal client avatar whoever that is where where are they going if you generally like to work you know you, you like to rent towards a certain uh, demographic um, again you've got to be careful not to violate fair housing but where do they where are they going to read these ads where are they going to see these things you know so that's that's some that's a consideration there um, so the other thing here, so we're, we're talking about, if you're just joining us, it's a, there are five key operational things a property manager must do to be effective. So number one, we talked about preservation of property. Number two, talking about managing vacancy. Um, number three is enforcing the lease. So earlier on, I talked about, obviously, actual vacancy. Here's where we're going to talk a little bit about economic vacancy. So the economic vacancy part is actually when someone is in the property and they're not paying rent. Now, obviously, through COVID and all of the eviction moratoriums and all of this stuff that's been going on, this is probably you know the, the toughest thing to do right now because the government has basically short-circuited the free market and they don't have an ability. It's really, really been difficult for many people in a lot of different markets to file for evictions. Um, I can tell you that in more landlord-friendly states that are, that are a little bit more reasonable in terms of what's, what they're allowed to do, the there have been evictions there have been evictions that have gone on and people have not been able to just kind of sit and chill and not do things in other states unfortunately they really had the landlord over a barrel but the eviction and um and um uh, foreclosure moratorium i'm not sure how how this is going to work out to to be honest with you i don't have a crystal ball but you know, I realistically, it's very politically popular right now to just keep kicking the can down the road. I don't know. Eventually, I'd like to see them phase it out over time. I'm not sure exactly how they could do that. But uh, but again, that's no one asked me. <laughs> so if they are willing to have that conversation, if you know, if you are a politician that has that sort of authority, feel free to look me up. I'm not hard to find. But um, that I do have ideas on that. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blow that up right now. But um, but enforcing the lease, I think, is one of the main things that you have to do as a property manager, and you have to do that well, and you have to have a systematic way of doing that, and you have to have a way of doing that so it does not uh, violate fair housing. You need to make sure that it's consistent across the board, which is what, unfortunately, many individual landlords fail at miserably because they don't have consistent systems. They're just dealing with whoever is yelling at them the loudest. Ask me how I know, because <laughs> I was so inconsistent back in the early days, back in 08 and 09, even, you know, I, I, it was it was crazy. And if someone wanted to say, well, you did that for me because I'm a Catholic and you didn't do them because, you know, because they were Jewish. Wait, what? Like, no, it had nothing to do with that. It had just the fact that you were yelling at me the loudest, right? So it that's why you really have to be careful about making sure that everything that you do is done consistently. Because consistency, as long as it's consistently, I mean, even if it's consistently bad, I can deal with that, but I don't recommend it. But it, as long as it's consistent, because we can fix it if it's consistent. If it's inconsistent, it's really hard to fix. Okay, 
So, um, so that's that's number three. So enforcement of the lease, and obviously that's not just payment of the lease, but it's also if they're responsible for mowing the grass and making sure that the that the furnaces filters are changed out and things like that. And this is one of the things that that, that always kind of gets me that when people are looking for a property manager to hire, and yet they, um, for whatever reason, I and I don't really understand this. But they limit the property manager in terms of being able to do their job. Well, if they're going to be enforcing the lease, they have to be doing property inspections, at least on a reasonably regular basis. I'd say once a quarter is probably about right. Um, I would say at least once every six months at the minimum. Doing it once a year just is not enough. I'm just telling you, it, it's, it's, too, it's too far along. It's, and people don't respect, naturally, people don't respect what you don't inspect. And, you know, and this isn't about being, you know, invasive. This is also about making sure that things may have developed that they didn't even recognize were problems. So I'll give you a quick example. I was pulling stuff out from under our kitchen sink, which seems to be the dumping ground for everything in our house. <laughs> so I was like, oh wow, that's where that thing went that the, the dog's toenail clippers went to. Evidently that belongs under the kitchen sink. But when I went underneath there, I noticed we had some ants. And I was like, wow, I would never have noticed because they were only under the sink. Now, again, I'm in this business and I still didn't notice it. But again, if if people don't go through this stuff reasonably often, this is sort of the sort of stuff that could damage properties. I mean, this is stuff that could have, if that was left to go on for a while, those ants could have damaged the property significantly, and I wouldn't even have noticed it. So that's the sort of stuff. Or what if a leak had developed underneath a sink and I didn't even notice it? Those sorts of things, right? So it's not always about being big brother. Sometimes it's about making sure, again, going back to number one, the preservation of property piece. So enforcing the lease is also tied hand in glove to preservation of property. Also, you got to think about t that too in terms of the preservation of the property going back to management of vacancy. They're not going to be able to manage the vacancy really well as a property manager if they're not allowed to preserve the property. Right? Makes sense seeing how these things are all tying together. So if they're if if you're going to say, well, yeah, go ahead and um, you know, don't paint the unit, but you know, go ahead and get it rented, preserve the, you know, manage vacancy. Well, it looks awful, right? In if if you're going to say well it, it doesn't it didn't need to be painted when I moved out well maybe that's true but that's also not reasonable most people are there's at least going to be some sort of touch up of paint or something that's going to have to go on in order for the properties to get rented okay so and again order in order to enforce the lease it's there's got to be some measure of you know you allowing them to go and do a reasonable and a reasonable number of inspections on the property. Now, some property managers, they will bake that into the cake with their pricing. And they'll say, okay, well, yeah, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, that, that's included in the, you know, 10% or 12% or whatever it is that they charge, right? Okay, that's fine. Some charge it more a la carte. And either way, if they are doing it a la carte, many of them charge it that way, you know, you've got to understand that they're sending people out that they are paying to do activity. So, you, you know, this is why it's really, really important to make sure that you're budgeting for this up front when you're buying the property. Because if you're planning on buying the property and never having inspections done or never having to repaint it every single turn or so those sorts of things, this is where you can get upside down really, really quickly. So this is, these are the sorts of things that you need to make sure. So again, we're talking about um, five key operational things a property manager must do to be effective. Um, so let's move on to number four. So number four is protecting profitability. Now this is, this is a little sticky because protecting profitability is uh, not just for the owner of the property, right? So many property managers have to be licensed brokers in the states that they manage in just because that's a licensing requirement. To um, But some states, you're not required to be a property manager, which I, I, I suppose that's fine. It doesn't, um, not really, I'm not really sure about that, how I feel about that. But, um, but regardless, protecting that profitability for the owner is, you know, your fiduciary responsibility. You need to be taking care of making sure that they have reasonable ability to protect their profits, meaning that 
you know, you're not leaving places unlocked. You're not leaving, uh, you're not putting people in, in the properties that really have no business being. So you need to make sure that they're underwritten well and, and these sorts of things. And also making sure that you're making good, sound, rational decisions when it comes to purchasing. You know, if a, if you can save money by doing a, an adequate but equally uh, you know, e a quality equal repair, you know, um, repair of equal quality, then and you can save money doing it a slightly different way, then yes, you should do that. So you need to preserve and protect their profitability. But that sword also cuts both ways. You must protect the profitability of your own business. I can't tell you how many property managers that come to me at, you know, from, for, for coaching that I have talked to that were making no money. They were doing, I'm thinking, where, you know, they would show me their books and I'm, I'm working with them I'm like, man, you are literally making no money. And some of them were operating at a loss. Now I get it. Last year was a little rough. That's that's a that's a that's a one-off. Let's just say that's a, that's an anomaly. But right now, if your property management company is not making money, I'm thinking, how in the world are you going to make money in a down economy when 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 money is not nearly you know is a lot tighter than what it is right now? So you know, there's a lot more competition for sure. But you need to be be able to pivot there. But you have to protect your own profitability in order to keep things moving along. Profit is not a four-letter word, okay? It is nothing wrong with profitability. It's not, obs it's not an obscenity. You need profits to obviously pay your people adequately and also make sure that you're continuing and process improvements. So we just recently changed over to a new property management software, which that that implementation did not go well, but um, now that we're kind of up and running, we're probably running around 70 to 80 percent, you know, where where we were before, and we're going to start to see as we as we continue to roll things out, we're going to start to see some synergies and some some better things happening with this new software. But but that was awful, like like it it, it and it took a while for that to happen, but. We wouldn't be able to do that if we didn't have profits. We wouldn't be able to do other things if we didn't have profits with with our with the property management company. So the profitability piece does run both ways. You have to be mindful that your property manager has to make money, and you know to expect them to do everything for ten percent. You know, like well, what do I pay that ten percent for? Well, generally that's just for the just you're paying for their infrastructure. You're paying for their website. You're paying for them to keep the lights on. You're paying. You know that part of that goes towards paying their staff, right? You can't expect them to do showings and maintenance and pick up your laundry for the 10%. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. You, you're, that 10%, you know, be specific. Find out what specifically that 10% covers. Um, but, but you, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with them making money as, as long as you're also making money. And if you're not making money because your property is over leveraged, that is not their fault. That is your fault. Okay, so either you spent too much money on the property or you over leverage it or leverage it or something else. So again, we're talking about uh, five key operational things a property manager must do to be effective. So let's run through those real fast. Number one is to preserve property. Number two is to manage vacancy. Number three is to enforce the lease. Number four is to protect the property. And then we're going to come to number five. We're going to wrap this section up is to communicate. They have to communicate. And this is communication in all various forms. They have to communicate not only to the residents, they have to communicate to the owners, they have to communicate to the vendors, and you know sometimes they have to communicate to the municipality or you know the, the you know whoever is responsible for overseeing uh, the laws and ordinances and and uh, and building codes and things like that. So they have to communicate. And they have to have a communication piece. Most times when I see a, uh, I'll, we'll get an investor that comes to us and they want to switch property management companies. Now again, most of the property management companies here in this town have been doing property management for a while. They've been doing it for a while. We all know each other. You know, I would like to think we all at least have some level of respect for one another, although that seems to be going out the window lately. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, that sucks because I've got a good relationship with many property managers here in town and we don't dog one another. We recognize how hard this business can be, and one person can just absolutely wear you out. And, um, and if you're if you're not if you're not careful, it just can start down a rabbit hole of just just bad bad stuff. But you know, I recognize how t how difficult this job can be, and I'm not about to entertain somebody if they come to me and say, "Hey, you know, I'm with so and so, and they just don't communicate. They're terrible. You know, they're the worst." Well, what issues are you running into? Because I'll be honest with you. When I'm taught, when I hear that people are 
that the property manager is bad at communicating. Well, what specifically do you mean? What's what are they bad at? And they might say, well, you know, I expect them to drive by the property every single day and then give me a phone call on terms of the status of the property. Okay, that's not ever going to happen by anybody consistently ever, and nor should it. There, you, you don't need that level of communication. I, I had one guy who I happily sent down the road because that was his expectation that we would drive by the property a couple times a week and let him know that the property was being mowed and maintained. Okay, that's fine. That's not for me. That's, that's not a good customer for me because there's no way I could do that and not charge him for that because, okay, fine. So he found a great property manager in his mind that was going to do it because they lived in the same neighborhood and was going to drive by the house every day and that worked for him and that was great I'm glad that he found somebody that that would work for him. that there's no way in the world I could have possibly managed that now I don't know if that property manager legitimately called and let him know twice a week that 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 the property was still good I don't know I have no idea if that was going to be you know again hopefully they had something consistently set up so they could do that you know in an automated way and not basically create a horrible job for yourself but the communication piece, the communication piece, why this is struggles, why this is a struggle for so many businesses, and I believe this is a struggle for a lot of businesses, not just property managers, but because they have limited infrastructure and limited process, this piece, communication, communication piece always falls apart with um, when you have bad infrastructure and bad process. It's just the nature of it. Think of, let's go outside of the realm of, of real estate for just a second and think about when you've had bad service at a restaurant okay think about it for just a second you're trying to communicate your order to the kitchen but because they don't have someone do, to do that right there's there's bad infrastructure or bad process meaning you know the waiter that was assigned to your table was assigned to 10 other tables and there's a waitress over here who's only being assigned to two tables well this dude is overloaded right that's either due to bad infrastructure, meaning this, maybe the, the scheduling software or whoever, however he was assigned to that table, that's that's you know that's obviously broken, or a bad process, meaning maybe if the the hostess who is you know all of 15, she didn't know any better to not assign someone who's got 10 tables to assign them one more table. Well, it's no, so again, bad infrastructure, bad process, and there's no negative feedback mechanism, meaning that what's the what's the mechanism to make sure that something that you know that when something doesn't happen right so what in this particular case the negative feedback loop would be how would the the manager the the, the restaurant manager know that we haven't been served yet how would they, we know that how would they know that we haven't gotten our waters yet or anything else what's the negative feedback loop how do you know when something doesn't happen right so most people think of a negative feedback loop meaning when, you know that something was bad right like I'm telling you something was bad. that's negative feedback no I'm talking about a negative feedback loop meaning you know how do I know when something doesn't happen so that's part of infrastructure that's part of process so again when when communication almost when it falls apart it's almost always because of bad infrastructure bad process so these are the sorts of things that you have to be mindful of so again we're talking about you know the the five key operational things a property manager must do to be effective and you know I'm going to wrap this piece up which again is preserving property managing vacancy uh, enforcing the lease protecting prop profitability and then of course communication so these are the sorts of things that I have you know as I have talked to other people about whether they're going to manage their own properties or they're going to hire a property manager to do this you know these these five things are fairly universal now, I'm sure you could come up with a few other things that operationally that they're responsible for but these these five things are pretty critical. I mean, if you there's if you get any one of those things wrong, you're going to have some significant problems with your property or with your property manager or just not knowing, right? So that's uh, we're going to go ahead and leave that there and move on to the next piece. So if you've got any questions, go ahead and you can post them in the comment section. I'll be happy to answer anything for you. But uh, we're going to move on now to a uh, a uh, an article that was posted today in Yahoo Finance by um, uh, and this was a this was an article about Mindy Jensen who's the co-host of the bigger pockets money podcast and she put out some really really good stuff here I thought it was really really great the some of the things that she was saying about just just some different pieces of advice 
that uh, that I thought were just really really fantastic. So we're not gonna I'm not gonna read the whole article here, but it was just a couple of things that I, I thought were really good. Now a couple of things that I didn't necessarily agree with, but again I'm not gonna beat her up because this I mean she's obviously been doing this forever. Um, actually she's been doing it right exactly as long as I have. She got a license. Um, uh, she got a real estate license in Colorado in 1998. Um, which is also actually I got started in '97, so maybe I got a, a half a year on her. But anyway, um, she was you know one of the things that she talked about was start you know to get started. You know what advice would you give your younger self about real estate investing? And she said to start, get a license and start working as a real estate agent. Dive deep into your market and learn everything you can about it. Now I I do agree with part of that to dive deep into the market and learn everything you can about your market. What are houses? selling for what what's driving value and what is you know once the, you can learn as much as you can about the market one of the things I remember that I used to do I used to look at the advertising in the classifieds and I would say okay if that property is located at that location and is driving and is they're asking that price you know what's driving that price versus the one that's on this side of town in that school district and then this one's getting three hundred dollars more you know what's the difference? What's driving those values? And um, and sometimes it, they're not going to make any sense. Sometimes it's purely just people want to live in one school district or one side of the. Uh, you know, it has nothing to do with quality. Has everything to do with just location, right? Sometimes it does have to do with quality. Where a house that is that has a two-car attached garage is going to rent more for more than a property without a garage, right? Or maybe a property that only has a one car detached garage, right? And they're not always exactly, I mean, you can't interpolate only so much. You can say, well, you know, maybe that property is getting the same amount because maybe it's just a lot bigger, right? So there's certain things that you can you can judge. But the, the, the difference is you have to know what's driving the values. You have to understand what people are valuing in the property and what people are valuing in your particular local market. You know, one of the things that <clears throat> drives this market where I'm in is four bedroom houses. There's not a lot of four bedroom houses that are rentals that are affordable. So as a result, because you go from a three bedroom house to a four bedroom house, the pricing is like, like parabolic. It's a very, very different price. You go to a different market down in Indianapolis, for example, and there's four bedroom houses everywhere. They're not that unique. So the difference is that there's just, you know, where do people see value in your particular market, and what, what would they pay a premium for? So that's uh, that's just different. So um, another question she was asked is, what are the biggest mistakes people make when it comes to real estate investing? And this one really hit me, and this is one that I've been talking about all the time. If you've been watching the Landlord Coach Daily Show at all, one of the things that I talk about very very consistently is not running the numbers. Um, making sure there's enough left over for a decent return on their investment. Most of the time that, and I'm seeing this over and over, is they just use very round numbers or they're using percentages when they should be using specific numbers. For example, they might say, well, I'm just going to throw in 10% vacancy. I'll throw in 10% for CapEx, capital expenditure, and, uh, you know, and then I'll, uh, you know, put in an extra 15% for miscellaneous. So I'm thinking, you know, man, that's, what are they what are they running the numbers based on well they're they're running the numbers based on possibly inflated rents right which they may not even be able to get and they're vastly overestimating the rent numbers and they're vastly underestimating the the expenses so as a result and if you've heard me say this before any number that you don't that you don't budget for on the expense category becomes a job that you create for yourself so if you've created a job for yourself in the expense category, that's a job you're never going to be able to get give that job over to somebody else until you have enough equity in the property that starts generating excess cash flow. And that can take a long, a long time. Again, ask me how I know. Because I ended up with a bunch of properties that I was able to salvage when I climbed out of my mess in 2009. But it was, you know, these were properties that didn't have a ton of equity. I was just able to save them because I was able to get into workout agreements. But that took a while to get those things paid down, right? Um, something else she said was falling in love with a property. Um, the 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 thing is, I totally get this. Like you can become very emotionally vested in a property, but you know because you may spend a lot of time trying to vet the property, right? So as a result, you become very invested, even though you haven't written a check yet. But falling in love with a property is is an emotional response 
absolutely try to keep it as clinical as you possibly can. Go through the numbers. If you don't love the numbers, do not fall in love with the property. Fall in love with the numbers. Don't fall in love with the property. Right. And then the other piece of this, which um, this was, this was, I mean, hit, she checked all the boxes here, was not having a large reserve fund or being able to cash flow repairs and mortgage payments. That is absolutely true. I can't tell you how many times people are like, well, you know, I need to use, utilize all my cash in the bank. I don't want to, you know, I would rather have that, you know, rather than having $50,000 setting aside, even, you know, you might have 10 or 12 rental properties. You know, they want to look to buy another property with that, even though that might be their financial cushion, it should things go sideways. And that was one of the things that absolutely buried me in 2008, 2009, because I just didn't have enough cash. I mean, I had, a, you know, I think about $150,000 and I burned through that in like 40 days. I mean, I burned through that so fast. I was like, well, that sucked because <laughs> I thought I had near enough for a $6 million portfolio. No, not even close. I didn't have near enough liquidity to, to maintain that. Now, looking back, I don't think I possibly could have set aside much more just because I bought the property so over leveraged. I was buying them and wasn't, I, I, again, I didn't, I didn't do the property analysis well enough, right? So um, a couple other things real, real quick is, uh, what are some rules of thumb that you swear by when choosing an investment property? She was asked, uh, again, this was a, a Yahoo Finance article posted today about Mindy Jensen, who is the co-host of, Mindy, of uh, Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. And I thought this was another, this was really, really good. Um, she had a couple things to say in there, but one of the things that jumped out at me um, was never buy weird. And that's so incredibly true. And I think, you know, I refer to these as poison properties. And these poison properties are, you know, just if, if it's a weird layout or if you have to walk through one bedroom to another, um, you know, because the bedroom is not a destination, um, you know, if it's if it's like, you know, I got a five bedroom and one bath, uh, you know, and the, and the one bath has a shower, you know, it's just it's just weird. Right. It's just a it's a strange layout. It might be a, it. It, uh, you know those sorts of things. Um, generally, you just have to be really, really careful of these because, especially if you're going to buy it, and eventually, even if you're buying and holding it, someone's going to want to have to live in that property. They're going to want to live there for a period of time. And if it's weird, if it's wonky, if it's just a, you know, I like buying boring. I like buying boring stuff that's just, you know, all day long. Well, we'll rent. We'll rent easy. We'll rent consistently. And these are the sorts of things that I like. So I mean, if <laughs> if there's anything that she said is you know never buy weird, buy uh, I like buying boring. And then finally, um, you know this is this is one of the last things that she said. What advice would you give to someone who wants to invest in real estate but may may not have the capital to invest in such a large investment? And again, this uh, once again is the uh, Mindy Jensen of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast who was interviewed on Yahoo Finance. And it says, if you want to get started in real estate investing without a lot of money, you're starting from a weak position. How are you going to handle emergency repairs? How are you going to pay the mortgage when the tenant doesn't pay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's ways to mitigate exposure, such as house hacking, which is renting a room in your house, uh, or you can live in a house while you flip in it, those sorts of things. But she's so spot on here that um, one of the things that I thought was really good that in that article is, again, looking at your cash position, making sure that you're not setting yourself up to fail. So you're not going to get into something that is, um, you know, when, when things, when hard times come and they will, when hard times come and they will, that you're not so over leveraged in your life that all of a sudden you have to create, you've created all these little jobs for yourself that you're never, ever going to be able to, uh, to get to. So a really, really good article. Um, I'm going to finish this up with this last article from uh, NFL player LaShawn McCoy, who is building a real estate empire using Opportunity Zones. Now, um, he was a uh, NFL uh, running back, or he is an NFL running back, um, and he is, uh, looks like, I think he plays for the Bucks. So um, he's, you know, looking at all of his investments, and he's looking into something that is the Opportunity Zones. Now, if you're not familiar with the Opportunity Zones, um, this came from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. So whether you love President Bush or you hate him or whatever, um, you have more reasons to love him and maybe you have more reasons to hate him. I have no idea. But I can't see a downside for this type of thing and neither can he. And it was really interesting because he even said, um, like, you know, it was, it, was, it was a bipartisan legislation which was – uh, for uh, Senator Cory Booker and Senator Tim Scott, one's a Democrat, one's a Republican, 
which was looking at this thing and trying to poke holes in it. And it was like, you know, it's a win-win because it's a win for people who want to invest and it gives significant tax breaks for people who want to invest in economically depressed areas. And guess what? It raises the, the standard of the housing in those economically depressed areas. This is a win-win across the board. So it's really, really good legislation. Um, if you are not familiar with it, I'll go ahead and post this uh, website here. It's uh, um, https uh, eda.gov forward slash opportunity dash zone. So I'll put that in the, uh, in the comments section here. So that way, if you um, want to go research it for yourself, go ahead and check it, check it out. So it's in there as the, um, in the opportunity zone. So you can go ahead and check that out, eda.gov forward slash opportunity zones. And um, it's really, I was really impressed by the way that he saw through the politics of it and was like, you know what, you know, even though he was trying to say, okay, you know, and I don't know what side of the aisle he, he landed on, it doesn't really matter, but it was really interesting because he was looking at it saying, you know, what's the, what's the downside to this? And they're like, there really isn't one. Everybody wins here. And it's such good, such good piece of legislation. I'm, uh, I'm really glad that uh, a lot of people are taking advantage of that on both sides who are, you know, whether they're residents or whether they are investors. It's really, really good. So, well, that's all I have um, today. So I um, didn't really have anything specifically to, you know, uh, didn't have an agenda here except, to, except you know, go over a couple of articles and pass along some things that I have come across. And uh, maybe I'll do these, you know, maybe once a week. I haven't really decided, that, but, uh, but some things were on my heart here and wanted to share that. And uh, hopefully you found this helpful. And if so, um, you can drop me a line. You can head over to landlordcoach.com or find me on on here on uh, on Facebook, or you can maybe drop me a line in the show notes here in the in the comments section here in YouTube. But either way, it's good to uh, good to be out and uh, you know just sharing these different things. Lot, lots of really cool and exciting things that are going on. So really cool. I'm gonna go ahead and sign off, and I will see you guys next time. I'm gonna show, sh sign off the normal way I sign off is. If you don't place a value on your free time, someone else will. But most important, there is no amount of money that will make time irrelevant. Have a great day, and I'll see you guys next time.